As an IT technician, you're going to find that in a lot of situations, troubleshooting or even repairing a laptop is going to be a pain. And a lot of that is because of these laptops and small form factor devices are engineered to very precise specifications. They are built to perform a very specific role and provide a very specific service. And because of that, if you ever have to get inside of that, it's going to be really challenging and to do any type of repairs that are needed. You're going to find that some laptops are easier to repair than others. It all depends on the manufacturers. Some make their laptops where you can go in and you can open them up and repair them easily. And some make their laptops where they're not really meant to be opened up and worked on. And as you continue in your career, the model that your organization you work at tends to order the most often, you're going to become an expert at that particular model. Now, a lot of manufacturers out there will provide their service documents online for you. And since this is a continuing changing process where these laptops and devices are, are being manufactured in different ways to perform different jobs on a continuous basis, you should always go to the manufacturer's website and look for these support documents before you start opening them up and work on anything. A good example on the screen here is you go to Dell's support webpage that I've linked in the PowerPoint. Laptops are made to be mobile, and so you need a power source for when you're not plugged directly up into the wall. And that power source is going to be your laptop's battery. And depending on the computer model, these can be really easy to replace, or you may have to open up the entire laptop to get to the battery. Depending on the device, this can be a quick five-minute fix, or it can be something that can take you an hour or more. Now, the two main battery technology that's out today is lithium-ion or lithium polymer. And this type of technology in batteries was made so that you can fully charge the battery and not worry about it, decreasing the lifespan of the battery as quickly as they used to. Now, all that being said, the battery will diminish over time, just not as quickly as it used to. With today's batteries, it will take several years before you have to actually replace the battery with a new battery. And typically, in my experience with these newer lithium ions and lithium polymers, by the time you have to replace the battery, the lifespan of the computer is at its end. And so the whole computer is typically not usable in a regular working capacity anymore. And because laptops have such a wide variety in their shapes and form factors, you're going to find that the battery type and the style is going to vary greatly as well. And the shape and style and how easy it is to get to the battery is changing constantly along with the laptop's form factor. So always reference the manufacturer's support pages on how to get to the battery. And if you are at a point in time where the battery has to be replaced, refer to the manufacturer to find the specific model battery that you need for the computer that you are working on. Now here I have a very general example of the two different types of batteries you're going to find out in the wild. On your left you have a very module battery where the manufacturer has built it specifically where you can quickly change the battery out. And this example is as simple as flipping a switch and then pulling the battery out and you can see how it's made to just snap right in. On the newer, smaller versions of laptops that are made to be extremely portable and extremely lightweight, you're probably going to see this example here, where you have to take off the whole bottom cover of the computer to get to the battery. And even once you're at the battery, if you look closely, you'll see that there's screws holding the battery in place that have to be removed as well. And now remember that these are just two general examples of batteries. They will vary greatly out in the wild. So as always, go to the manufacturer's website and look up your specific model machine that you are working on before you replace the battery. And you can also find service documents online that will tell you how to take this bottom cover off on this picture here and if there were any other parts over top of the battery that had to be removed before you get to it and you can also find in the service manual what specific tool you would need to remove these screws that are holding the battery in place. Your laptop keyboard in my opinion is going to be the most used component of your laptop and that's because it's the main input source for your computer. And typically, it's a really easy component to replace on your laptop. Again, this all depends on the manufacturer and I always suggest you go to your manufacturer's website first. But typically, if you look at the underside of this keyboard here, you have a ribbon attached to the keyboard, which then will go around and plug into the motherboard of your computer itself. And the manufacturer's website will tell you how easy it is to get to this ribbon and to this connection. It, it can be as simple as just taking the back cover off, which is just a few screws, or you may have to take the back cover and a few other components out to get to it. So depending on the model, it may not be a simple fix. Now, depending on the situation, depending on the model of the machine, and depending on the age machine, it may be easier to just use an external keyboard. 
and this external keyboard can be connected by USB or by Bluetooth. We'll go into more detail about that later. It can work in a pinch, even though it's not quite as portable as the built-in keyboard is for the laptop. So you would just have to look at the situation to determine if you need to replace the keyboard or just find an external keyboard. And speaking from experience, most organizations out there are going to have a lot of surplus external keyboards just lying around. One of the challenges with laptops becoming smaller is that the keyboards themselves are also becoming smaller. And more and more keys are turning into function keys. If you look at this example here, the numeric keypad is missing because there's not enough room for it. And the arrow keys are jammed up underneath the shift key. Now this model here, they actually made room for the number pad at the side. But if you look, the function keys still have secondary actions associated with them to help save space. In your career, you're probably going to come across a situation in which a laptop key is either not functioning at all or is having some type of function issue. In these situations, you may have to repair or replace the keycap. Now, while this process is doable, you need to be extremely careful when doing this. In some situations, it can be as simple as just cleaning dirt or trash out from the keyboard and around the specific key having issues. Or you may have to replace the actual key cap, which is what's being done in this example here. You can see the key cap there. Always go to the manufacturer's website first before starting this procedure, because this is a very, very delicate process and it's very, very easy to accidentally break something. For example, the components underneath the key cap are extremely delicate. And in my opinion, it's only worth replacing it if the manufacturer's warranty on the laptop is still applicable. If it's not, in my opinion, just use an external keyboard. And again, that's just my personal opinion for when you're out in the wild. That's not something you're going to be quizzed about on your CompTIA exam. My personal opinion is not going to show up on the, your CompTIA exam. So just keep that in mind. Everything running on your computer requires memory. And in laptops, you'll use what's called SODIM, which stands for Small Outline Dual Inline Memory Module. And depending on what all you have running on your computer, you may have to replace the memory or add more memory. Now, this is typically a very easy process to do. Again, refer to the manufacturer's website to see just how easy it is to get to the memory modules. But typically, it's as simple as just taking off the back cover of the device, and there they are. Now, some laptop models out there, you'll find the memory is soldered into place, which means that you would have to replace the full system board of the machine or get a new machine. Before doing any type of work on a laptop, go out to the laptop's manufacturer's website and look up this information. Now, this is not going to be covered in the CompTIA exam, but out in the wild, you're going to find that some memory modules are brand specific on these newer devices. So in other words, you have to go and get the replacement memory from the manufacturer that you purchased the laptop from. And this picture here is an example of this brand specific memory module. Now, again, this is not going to be on the CompTIA exam. This is just something for your information as you continue in your IT career. Now, in this example, to get to the RAM memory module, you had to take off the entire bottom cover of the laptop and as you can see compared to the rest of the laptop sodiums are relatively small and easy to put in it's as simple as placing sodium into the memory module and slowly pushing it into place down towards the keyboard until you feel the physical pops of the clamp clamping it into place and once you feel that you now have memory in your laptop Laptops will also have some sort of built-in storage on older laptops you're gonna find magnetic discs and they're usually small traditional spinning type drives like this 2.5 SATA or this M SATA. So these are small form factors that are built to be inside of a laptop and portable. Your newer laptops will have SSDs or solid state drives instead of the traditional spinning drive. And looking at this comparison picture, you can see that they're significantly smaller when compared to the older 2.5. And this is solid state, which means no moving parts. Now the speed compared to the original 2.5, the SSDs are significantly faster. And so for a lot of machines, a very simple upgrade you can do is to take out the 2.5 spinning disk and replace it with an SSD. And you will usually see a very significant increase in the speed of that laptop. Now SSDs are in turn also getting smaller and faster as technology develops. For example, this M.2 is a smaller size compared to the NVMe SSD, and it's also significantly faster compared to the NVMe. Both of these SSDs are easy to replace or to even upgrade. They both just plug into a slot, and then you put a screw at the top to help hold it in place. And even newer models of laptops have a small access door that you can open up and be right there at the SSD. 
When it comes to replacing laptop storage, you're going to find that all the components are internal to the machine, and it can be as simple as just opening the back cover and having direct access to the memory modules. For example, in this photo where there was just a cover on the back that needed to be unscrewed to get to both the 2.5 drive that it had available slot and the SSD slots that were available. In some situations, you're going to find that the storage connections are in the middle of the device, and so you have to take the whole device apart to get to it. Now, regardless of how easy or hard it is to get to the storage bay, replacing the storage in a laptop is usually as simple as just removing a few screws and then lifting it out. Looking at this picture here, you actually have a strap available to grip the SSD once you've unscrewed it and to lift it out. And then the smaller MBME2 SSDs, then to put a new SSD in, you simply slide it into the SATA connections depending on the type and then reinsert the screws. Because of how significant the speed increase is from a hard disk drive to an SSD or solid state drive, it's going to be very common that you're going to be making this type of upgrade and change to laptops in your day to day job as an IT professional. Since it's almost like getting a brand new laptop once you've replaced it. Now there are many different ways you can do this type of upgrade. One very common way you're going to find in your IT career is to install a new OS on the new SSD and then have the user transfer any of their documents or software over to the new device. Another way to do this is to move the entire user profile over to the new SSD. What's also known as cloning the original spinning disk to the SSD. There's lots of different software available, both paid and open source, and cloning the hard drive can be faster whereas copying documents over can be very time consuming. An advantage of cloning one drive to another is that you do not have to pre-install an operating system on the destination disk. And this clone image moves everything all at one time from one disk to another. It moves all their documents and all their programs all at once. Now to clone a hard drive, you're gonna need special software that's built to do this. And there are many open source options out there and a lot of manufacturers will actually include cloning software with their SSDs. And typically every cloning software will have a user portal where you'll select the source disk and then the destination disk along with other options with the cloning process. Now depending on the organization you're working at, you may find that your organization has one image file that's already pre-built with the software and programs that the users are gonna need that your organization uses to image every brand new machine they purchase so that when a new machine comes in, users can simply log into the machine and have all of their apps already there where they can easily access it and continue going on with their job. Now, a lot of imaging software out there will also have an option where you can plug directly up to the two devices and directly clone onto the destination disk of the machine as it's up and running. Now this usually depends on both devices being up, running, and connected to each other as this is going on. But again, this all depends on the type of device it is and the type of software you're using. Because of the portability of laptops, many laptops have 802.11 wireless capable cards built into the motherboard. Typically they're small form factor like this and you plug it up into a connection and then you have screws holding it in place. And then from the SATA connection, you're gonna have a wire that typically goes from its location up to the, to the top of the screen of your laptop since that's gonna be the highest point on your laptop. A lot of times this is gonna be an 802.11 connection so that you can get high speed internet on these LAN networks. Now some of these cards are capable of Bluetooth as well or you may see a, a similar card for Bluetooth on your computer and Bluetooth is a personal area network. It has a very short range but it enables you to connect nearby devices to your machine. Uh, for example there's Bluetooth keyboards, there's Bluetooth earbuds. Uh, there are really many different examples more than I can get to in this video but it makes it really handy when working in a small environment or while traveling to keep your devices connected. Now these are designed to be replaceable. So typically you'll find a small cover with quick access to the PCI slots or you just snap them out of place. And in some cases, unscrew a screw. So very similar to memory. As you can see from this example, it simply snaps into a SATA connection. Then you put a simple one single screw to hold it in place. And then you have the antenna connected to the connection and then going through the computer to the highest point on the laptop. And newer devices come equipped with biometrics where you can use your fingerprint or even face recognition to sign into your computer or unlock it. 
This that is referred to as something you are. There's usually two components of biometric settings. First, you need the actual software in the device to support it, and then you need the actual physical hardware on the device. In the example of a fingerprint, you'll need a fingerprint reader for the device. In the example of using your face, you need a physical camera. And all of this is so that the software can verify that it's actually you trying to get into the device. For this example for Windows, you'll see the different sign-in options that are available. You have the password, which everybody is familiar with, but you also have the Hello Face option, the Hello Fingerprint option. You can set up a Windows Hello Pin, or you can even use a security key. Since it's really difficult to duplicate somebody's face or their fingerprints, this is considered relatively secure. And in many situations, you might require multiple forms of identification to add extra security to it. For example, you may require a password and a fingerprint just to double check that you are who you say you are to sign in. Here is an example of a laptop keyboard with a fingerprint reader built into it, but you can also purchase external fingerprint readers that can be plugged up via USB to the laptop. Near field communication is also becoming very common. Near field communication takes place in a very short distance, usually four centimeters or less. This can be used for authentication or, dan or data transfer. Some common examples you'll see are using the smartwatch to pay for something or the tap to pay on most new credit card methods. But this can also be used in an ID badge in order to verify you are, you are who you are to get into a secure area. Some common examples of using NFC for authentication are hospital workstations where the personnel just come up to the machine, scan their card without having to put in a password and go to work. Warehouses and manufacturing facilities are also using this. In most of these instances, this is a situation where the device you're using, you only need to use it for a limited amount of time. And so you just scan your card, verify who you are without putting in a password, do what you need to do, and then you can just walk away and it will instantly lock and close behind you. A lot of the laptops today have an LCD display. This is a liquid crystal display. And this is where you have a series of liquid crystals associated with color filter, and there's a back light source shining through those crystals, producing the image that you'll see on your screen. From the perspective of a laptop, some advantages of using LCD in a display is that they're lightweight, they're relatively low power compared to the laptop as a whole, and they're relatively inexpensive to make, which keeps the total cost of the laptop low. Some disadvantages to an LCD display. One disadvantage is that because this light has to shine through from the back to give us an image it makes it really hard to get a true black color in the image and another disadvantage is depending on the manufacturer there are many different types of backlights being used it could be fluorescent it could be led there are several other options that it could be and because this backlight is in the back of everything else that's in this display it makes replacing this light very difficult to do there are three different technologies with lcds first you have the twisted pneumatic lcd which is considered the original lcd twisted pneumatic lcd had very fast response time when it came to producing the display image and the colors, which makes it really great if you're a gamer to use. But it was prone to color shifts, which means if you went to the side of the display, you can see that there's an inversion of the color, so it had poor viewing angles. So for the best possible view of a TNLC, you had to be directly in front of it looking straight on. If you're looking for the best possible color representation with an LCD, you want to use in-plane switching or IPS LCD. This gives you really great color representation, which is great for if you're using graphics or if you're doing desktop publishing. But this comes at an extra expense when compared to the TN LCD. If you're looking for something that could be considered a good compromise between TN and IPS, the vertical alignment or VA LCD is a good in-between. While VA comes with really good color representation, you'll find that the response times are slower when compared to the twisted pneumatic LCD. If you have a newer laptop, you may have an organic light emitting diode display. This is an organic compound inside the display that emits a light when it's receiving an electric current. So there is no backlight involved in an OLED display. Because there is no backlight and there are no crystals, these are typically very thin displays and they're usually lighter, flexible, and are considered more mobile when compared to LCD displays on a laptop. And there's usually no glass on the front of the display to protect it. The key to the OLED display is this organic material that provides its own light when electrical current is applied to it, so there's no need for a backlight. 
which allows the OLED display to be very thin. OLED displays are very common on tablets and phones and smartwatches, so small mobile devices. And this is because of the excellent color representation that you can get from them and because of how light and thin they are. And this makes it really easy to carry these devices. Not a lot of people think about it, but your laptop display plays a critical role in how your laptop connects to wireless networks. Because when your laptop is open, your display is the highest point on the laptop. It makes it a perfect place for all your different wireless antennas to run their antenna cables through. And this can be different types and multiple wireless antennas all on the same machine. This can be 802.11 Wi-Fi, or this can be Bluetooth, or something else. And because of this, this makes replacing a laptop display extremely difficult, because not only do you have to think about all the video components that are attached to the display, but you also have to think about the antennas that could be wrapped around the screen as well. So again, always go to the manufacturer's website before you attempt a repair on a laptop. This is a good picture of your laptop display that shows the additional internal components. You have two wireless antennas that are wrapped around the side of the display, but you also have the internal components for the built-in webcam as well. Most newer laptops have webcams built into the displays themselves, and it's usually a small hole at the top of the display, and some manufacturers have installed a privacy screen over the web camera where you slide it in one direction or the other to open or close the web camera. And a lot of times these are used for online meetings or conferences or while somebody is traveling. And while these built-in microphones are great for video calls or while traveling and working, the sound quality is not always that great. So for somebody that's making a how-to video or doing some type of presentation pre-recorded, you may want to use a USB microphone instead, which typically has a better sound quality to it. Now we mentioned earlier that liquid crystal displays need some kind of light in the back to shine through the crystals to produce the image that we see on the display. If this is an older laptop, this may be a cold cathode fluorescent lamp. Now these required a higher voltage and a higher power input than the LEDs that we use today. And the CCFLs are also thicker compared to the LEDs, taking up more space in your laptop and making your laptop heavier. CCFL is no longer very common, but you may find them on older laptops. Newer LCD displays may use a LED light instead of a fluorescent lamp. These LED lights may be around the edge of the display or they may be found in an array behind the screen similar to this picture here. These are becoming so common that instead of referring to them as an LCD display, they're usually referred to as an LED display. When in reality, they are of course a LED backlit LCD. If you're working on one of these older CCFL monitors, you may find a backlight inverter. In these type of situations, these converters are converting your laptop's DC power into the AC power that the display needs. Now, one way to verify if your backlight has gone out is to take a flashlight and shine it at the display. And if you can make out some images on the display, then your problem is probably the backlight. If this is a CCFL display, you may just have to replace the inverter. However, on some systems, you may have to replace the entire display. So always go to your manufacturer's website and check the documentation to see what applies to your specific model. If you're using a hybrid type device similar to this tablet on the screen, where not only you have a display you can directly interact with, but you also have a keyboard attachment that can connect as well. You may be able to use the this, this stylus for high resolution input. This is also known as a digitizer. Now this is becoming more and more common on laptops, tablets, and other hybrid slash mobile devices. The stylus enables you to write or draw on the screen, and this input is being digitized from the screen into a format that the tablet or device itself can recognize. So the digitizer inside the display takes the input from the stylus and converts it to electrical signals that the computer can understand. Now your digitizer in your device may only allow for a stylus input, but it's also very common for them to accept input from touch. A touchscreen digitizer takes input from your finger and converts it into electrical signals that your computer understands. And this is a very common way to use many laptops and tablet devices that are around today. And a lot of times the same system will accept a touch, a stylish, and a keyboard and merge the input into electrical signals that the device can understand. So it really just comes down to using the device that works best in your particular situation. 
these small computers that we carry around every day with us really are amazing devices. The amount of things they can do is constantly changing and constantly getting more and more impressive. And the many different ways you can connect to these devices is constantly changing as well. It can be wired or wireless, and there's different sets of standards that have come out through the years. And this connectivity is used to synchronize all the many different accounts we have. It can be used to back up data. It can be used for identification purposes. And there's lots of other uses for this connectivity. For the majority of devices out there, we use USB, Universal Serial Bus, as the main connection type to these devices. USB is designed for high-speed mobile communication, and it is often used to connect your device to a computer or to an external power source. You're probably already familiar with the USB Type-A that we see in, on the majority of computers out there, but your mobile devices themselves may have a different type of connection to it. They may have a Micro-B or even a C. Older devices used a Mini-B type plug, but many of those devices have now started using the micro USB. And these are not the only ways to connect and charge our mobile devices, but these are some of the more common ways that you'll find. A lot of new devices use this USB-C. USB-C is 24 pin and it's double sided, which means that it can be used on both the power adapter and on the device itself. And you're probably already finding that more and more devices have USB-C as opposed to the old USB-A. The USB standard is what actually defines what this plug looks like, but you can send different types of signals through that same interface. For example, you can use USB-C for display port. You can connect USB-C to an HDMI, and you can also use USB-C as, as a Thunderbolt connection. If you have an Apple product, you may not be using any of the previous mentioned USB connections. You may be using what's called a lightning connection. This connection type is Apple proprietary. It is an 8-pin connection that sends digital signals. And it's most often seen on iPhones and iPads. The lightning connectors have some advantages over the micro USBs. One advantage is that it supports a higher power output, which which means you're able to charge your phone or tablet faster with a lightning connector. This connector can also be used either way, which means you can use the lightning connector on the tablet or phone itself or to connect it to the straight to the charger. What all this means for an IT professional is that you're probably going to walk around with a lot of different cables or adapters on hand just so that you're prepared for any type of device you come across. Before USB connections came out, you would use a serial connection. The most common type was a DB9. And if you look at the picture here, that stands for the nine pins. And sometimes we would hear this called a DE9. DB9 is commonly used to carry RS-232 signals, and this is an industry standard that's been around since 1969, and you can probably still find some, some of these DB9 connections on older infrastructure hardware in your server. And before the USBs came around, this was considered the standard for any type of device you had to connect to your computer. So if you had a modem or you had a mouse, it was probably using DB9 over a serial connection to your computer. Today, you see a lot more USB type devices than you do DB9 type devices. But if you have older infrastructure equipment like switches, routers, or firewalls, they probably still have a DB9 serial connection on them. And you can even find USB to DB9 converters so that you can configure these infrastructure devices and connect them to these newer laptops that don't have serial connections on. Today, a very popular method of mobile communication is what's called NFC or near field communication. This is where you send small amounts of data wirelessly over a very short distance. This is typically built into our phones and the most common use for it is for payment systems. Uh, for example, in the photo, using your phone to tap pay with your credit card. But something like this can also be used for identification where you use your phone to scan to get into a secure area. Probably the one thing that I use the most with my phone when it, when it comes to mobile connections is the Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is a high speed communication that takes place over a short distance. Bluetooth is what is considered a PAN or personal area network. Bluetooth is used to connect to our phones. They're used to connect to headsets, to health monitors, to our cars, to our smart watches, to our external speakers. It's really endless what you can connect to using Bluetooth on your mobile device. You're probably already familiar with connecting your phone to a wireless hotspot at your office or at your school, but more and more devices are able to also turn into a hotspot themselves and allow other people to connect to the internet through them and your mobile carrier provider cellular network. Now, not all phones and not all mobile carriers support this hotspot function, and many may require an additional charge for the data cost associated with operating as a Wi-Fi hotspot. Either way, it's a real convenient way to enable your devices that may be Wi-Fi only to connect to the Wi-Fi on your mobile device 
through your mobile carrier if you ever need to. Many of us use tablets and mobile phones every day, and we use our fingers to manipulate and select things that might be on the screen. But there are other ways to provide input into these devices, and one of these methods is through the use of a touch pen. This is a touch screen pen. You might see this referred to as a touch screen stylus or a captive stylus. It allows you to manipulate and activate the interfaces on these devices without physically touching the screen with your hand. If you like to take notes by hand, if you're like me and you like to take notes by hand, or you'd like to sign your name on the screen, you might want to use one of these touch pens. Since we're using, since we're used to using a pen or pencil to perform many of these functions, it simply emulates the same process on something like a phone or a tablet. This also makes it a little bit easier to see what's on the screen because your hand has been moved away from the screen itself. So if you need to perform very precise functions or be able to or, or be able to do something very specific on the screen, you may want to try using a touch pen. If you are an artist or someone who wants to perform more precise work on a tablet, you may want to try using an active stylus. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as a digital stylus. As a digital stylus. And this does provide with and this provides you with more functionality and more precise usability than something like a captive touch pen. The stylus is able to communicate independently with the device that's being used even if those two devices are not touching each other. When you do touch the pen to the device, the pen can recognize how much pressure you're using on the screen and can change what you're displaying on the screen as you're writing. This can also influence different buttons along the device as you can tap, double tap, or perform some other function by clicking a button on the pen rather than touching the screen itself. Unlike a captive stylus, which can be used on any captive touchscreen device across many different manufacturers, an active stylus is commonly associated with a certain group of devices. For example, if you're like me and you use an Apple iPad, you would be using an Apple's own you would be using Apple's own Apple Pencil to interact with the device using their active stylus. But what if you're using a computer that doesn't have a type but what if you're using a computer that doesn't have any type of captive display or any type of active touchscreen that you can interact with? In cases like this, you can add a touchscreen capacity. In cases like this, you can add a touchscreen capability with an external drawing pad. This takes an active stylus, which you've already seen, and combines that of an external digitalizer that you then connect to the computer, usually by USB. This gives you the same precise input as an active stylus, but allows you to use it across many different systems. So if you're using different operating systems or would like to have the same type of precise input on your computer as you might have on your mobile phone or your tablet, you may want to include an external drawing pad with an active stylus. If you've ever used a laptop, you may have noticed that the laptop doesn't have any external mouse that comes with it. Instead, the mouse functionality is built into a trackpad that's commonly on the device itself. This is, this is very useful when you're working on the road and there's limited space in an airport or on a plane, and you would just like to be able to move things around the screen and interact with a number of different presses. You can use the built-in trackpad on your device to accomplish that. You can also take some 
You can also take that same functionality you're using on your laptop and bring it to a desktop system with an external trap bed. These are usually battery powered and connect to your system over Bluetooth, making for a very simple connection and one that you can use on almost any system. If you're using the keyboard on a laptop, you may find that sometimes you inadvertently move the cursor or click a mouse button because you accidentally hit the trackpad. On some laptops, you're able to disable the trackpad through the built-in function keys. This would allow you to still continue to use the keyboard, but would disable any of those inadvertent key presses on the trackpad itself. So if you're accident... If... If you've done a lot of work on your computer with audio and video, or you've been using a mobile phone to communicate, you may be using a headset to make the process a little easier. These can sometimes be wired headsets that connect via USB to your device, or they might have a three and a half, or they may have a three and a half millimeter TRRS connection. The TRRS connection stands for Tip Ring Ring Sleeve. This is an analog audio jack that takes the information your that takes the information you're talking into your microphone or audio that you need to hear and sends it through the copper connection that's plugged into the device. If you're an Apple user, you may not have the option of a USB or a three point or a three and a half millimeter or a three and a half millimeter audio connection. Instead, you may be able to use the lightning port that's built, into the af that's built into the iPad or iPhone. And of course, if you don't want any wires connecting your headset, you may be able to use a Bluetooth headset and connect to your device wirelessly. I mentioned that the 3.5mm audio jack is often used to connect and it is a TRRS connection. It stands for the tip ring ring sleeve connection that is able to separate all the signals that you need to be able to both listen and to all the audio signals that you need to be able to both listen to the audio and talk into the microphone for both input and output to that device. And if you're using an Apple device, you may want to use wired headset with a lightning connector or use something like a Bluetooth where you can get rid of all of the wires and connect wirelessly to the device. One of the challenges with our mobile phones and tablets is that the speakers inside of these devices are very, very small. So if you like better sound from your mobile devices, you may want to use a set of external speakers. These are usually battery powered and connect to your device over Bluetooth. And connect to your device over a Bluetooth wireless connection and allow you to have a much better sound because the speakers inside of the device are obviously much larger than the speakers in your mobile phone. And with the wireless and battery powered functionality, this is also a very portable option for listening to your favorite music. If you're watching this video on a laptop, a tablet, or a mobile phone, you may notice that the, t you may notice that the top of that device is a camera or a webcam. The use of these cameras has changed a lot over time, and these days we're using them extensively for multimedia and video communication. If you're someone who takes your laptop back and forth between the office and home, you may notice that you are constantly plugging and unplugging cables whenever you arrive at one of these locations. One way to minimize all of this plugging and unplugging of cables is to use a docking station. The docking station stays in place at your office or your home, and you would simply need to remove the laptop from the docking station, move it to the other location, and place it into the other docking station.
All of the other devices you use, such as a printer, your keyboard, your mouse, and displays are all plugged into the docking station so you don't constantly have to plug and unplug different devices depending on where you happen to be. Some, div some docking stations can even support additional adapter cards. So if you want to extend the hardware functionality of your laptop, you may want to look into a docking station that provides these additional capabilities as well. If you, would like something, if you would like something simpler and smaller than a docking station, you may want to use something like a port replicator. This is very similar to a docking station, but you connect to the this port, mm, but you connect to this port replicator usually through a USB connection that's on the replicator itself. These are also usually very small and don't support the ability to add an adapter card into the port replicator, but this does speed the process of connecting and disconnecting, especially when you're trying to get that laptop from one place to another. You would simply connect over USB, and you would have all these other ports on the port replicator available for use while you're connecting. <clears throat> I, pers <clears throat> I personally keep a port replicator in my laptop bag for while I'm traveling. Many of the things we do in our normal workday involve using our mobile phones, or what we often call our cell phones. And we call these cell phones because they are using what is called a cellular network. And we call it cellular because we are separating up the geography of an area into sections or cell. And we put antennas up at the edges of all these cells so that we're able to maintain connectivity wherever we might happen to travel. Some of the original networks were called 2G networks and they consisted of two global standards. One of these standards was GSM, Global System for Mobile Communication, and the other one was CDM, Code Division Multiple Access. Now, both of these standards were very good for voice communication, but they had very, very limited support for sending data across these wireless networks. These were originally circuit switch networks and they had to be upgraded in order to allow some kind of data connectivity. GSM was a very big part of the early cellular network. GSM standing for Global System for Mobile Communication. At that time, GSM took up about 90% of the worldwide market. It was considered the standard for the European Union, and it allowed you to have coverage regardless of where you traveled around the world. In the United States, this was used by AT&T and T-Mobile. GSM allowed you to keep all of your modular information on what's called a SIM card, or Subscriber Identity Module, and you could move that SIM code from phone to phone, and your phone number would follow you as you change phones. Originally, GSM used multiplexing, and multiplexing allows multiple people to communicate at the same time over the same frequency. So everyone in the network got a little bit of time that they shared amongst each other. This allowed many people in one geographic area to both send and receive voice and data communication. CDM is the code division multiple access. And with CDM, you had multiple people communicating over the same network, but as people are sending information, they sent it with a specific code, and each call used a different code, and then your particular handset could filter out any codes that was not related to the actual connection that you were using, and focus only on the code related to you and the person you were communicating with on your phone. CDMA was commonly used by Verizon and Sprint, and they would control exactly what handset you could use on these networks. However, CDMA was not widely adopted by other providers or, or in other parts of the world. As more people were trying to send different types of data over the network, we needed new standards that were able to handle these new features. And one of these new standards was the 3G technology, also known as the third generation technology, and this was introduced in 1998. This allowed us to transfer larger data sizes and at higher speeds over the same network. Usually in a best case scenario with 3G, we got several megabytes per second. And with this enhanced capability, we were able to introduce new features with our cell phones. For example, we started having GPS capabilities. Some phones started being able to do mobile television, along with video on demand and video conferencing capabilities. 
It was becoming increasingly clear that the differences between GSM and CDA was causing significant issues with people that wanted to move between different providers or change between different networks that may be more reliable in their area. In order to merge these together, we came out with LTE, our long-term evolution, and this is 4G technology. This is a converged standard, so networks that use GSM and CDM were able to use LTE to send data over their networks. LTE was based on GSM and what we call EDGE, our enhanced data rates for GSM evolution. All of these combined into LTE increased our, our throughput up to 150 megabits per second on the best possible LTE mobile connection. And then in some areas, there was also an upgraded version of LTE called LTE-A, our LTE Advanced. And LTE-A doubled the throughput up to 300 megabits per second. In 2020, they introduced a new generation of cellular connections called 5G, our fifth generation cellular network. And 5G networks had a significant increase in speed of up to 10 gigabytes per second on the best 5G cellular connection. And even some of the slower speeds were around 100 to 900 megabits per second. And that's still significantly faster than the older LTE network. Now, if we are able to significantly increase the speed of data, of data being sent over our mobile networks, then we're going to be able to greatly increase capabilities of our mobile devices. And this can greatly impact our usefulness of Internet of Things devices. And this is where we have many different types of devices on the network that all need some sort of connectivity. This can allow us to have much larger file transfers between these devices. We can increase the applications on these devices themselves, and they could be able to store even more data up into the cloud for even more processing. Many of the updates on our devices occur in the operating system itself. One of these updates is called a PRL update. This is a preferred roaming list. This allows your phone to know where all of the towers are for the network provider that your phone is tied to. And this update can be performed over the air. So you may see that an OTA update is occurring and if that's happening, it may be a PRL update. And some phones have the capability to combine their cellular network with an 802.11 network. And this is when your phone turns into a Wi-Fi hotspot. And this is your own personal wireless router that is using your cellular network to connect devices to the internet. And so your phone becomes a hotspot for any nearby devices to connect to. Now, not all phones support this additional capability of being used as a hotspot. So you need to check your settings first. And even if you do have the option for a hotspot, many cellular providers charge an additional cost for the data associated with it. So you may want to check with your provider before enabling. When you turn on a mobile device for the very first time, you're going to see that a lot of settings are already pre-configured. For example, your phone number should be working and people should be able to text you and you should be able to text others from your phone. But there are other settings on your phone that you're probably going to need to set manually. For example, email. Now, every organization handles email differently, but there's usually always a configuration specific to your organization that needs to be set up on your device. You may want to also set up a cloud-based service or some sort of synchronization service so that all your accounts on your mobile phone and on your laptop and on your desktop will all sync together at the end of the day. And this can also be important for backup and recovery in case you lose this mobile device. Large organizations usually rely on Microsoft for email along with, along with other cloud-based services that Microsoft offers in order for the whole company to communicate. The setup process is typically the same for Outlook, Exchange, or even Hotmail, regardless of which of those three you're using. You'll be required to authenticate with Microsoft 365, typically using just your username and password. Sometimes you'll be required to set up a two-factor device during this process. Once you've successfully logged in, you are then presented with a screen that asks you what exactly you want to sync with this account. For example, you'll be asked if you want to sync your contacts, your calendars, your reminders, your notes, your mail, etc. And you can enable or disable these different items as needed. And this process is typically the same regardless of the email service you're using. And once you have it set up and everything synced, you should be able to access your email across your many different devices. If you have an Apple device, you'll have the option to sync up with the iCloud. This is a cloud-based service that's built into iOS and iPad iOS devices. 
To connect to the iCloud, you typically will enter in your Apple ID and password. And once you sign in, it gives you access to select the synchronization options. Now, iCloud is usually a pretty extensive list of customization that you can do with the many different apps and devices you have. And you can select and deselect exactly what information you want to sync with the cloud and what you want to keep local on the device. This means if you're using a Mac device, you can sync, you can possibly sync everything between your mobile device your desktop, your laptop, your iPhone. So regardless of what device you're using, you can pick up right where you left off at. And even though on something like iCloud, you have very extensive settings you can go through and specialize what specific app and what specific information you want to sync with each device, you still have complete control over what you want to sync to the cloud and what you want to leave on the device, regardless if it's an iPhone or an Android or what carrier device you have. And between all the different data types there are, you may want to sync up to the cloud your mail, but you want to keep, but you may want to keep your pictures on your personal device, or you may want to sync your contacts up to the cloud and leave your calendar on the mobile device. Now you need to keep in mind this could be sending and receiving a very large amount of data. So you also have control in your settings on how this data is sent and on what network it is using. You can go into the network settings on your phone and tell it to only sync over wireless or you can tell it to sync over both wireless and cellular data. You can also turn on and off different data connections or you can even set up data limits on your phone where you're alerted when, you, when you've gone over a certain amount of data usage on if you have ever attached an exterior device to your tablet or to your mobile phone, then you have gone through the Bluetooth pairing process. This is a built-in security setting that allows you to control exactly what devices are connected to your mobile phone or to your tablet. You typically have to verify a phrase or a pin while going through the Bluetooth connection process when going through the connection process for the first time. The Bluetooth pairing process is something that you only have to go through one time. And then after you set up that connection, every time that those devices are together and turned on, they will automatically connect and start communicating with each other. I'm going to go through kind of a generic pairing process, but this, but the exact steps can vary greatly depending on the type of device that you're connecting to. So always check your manufacturing documentation for whatever type of mobile phone, tablet, or wireless device you're using. The first step in the pairing process is to go into your settings and to enable Bluetooth on both devices. On an Android or an iPhone, you're going to go into settings. You should see for an option for connections and then Bluetooth. And it should be a simple just toggle switch to toggle it on. Now, depending on what you're connecting to, you, your device may have where you have to hold on. a may be where you have to hold a button down until an indicator light comes on. So, again, check your manufacturer's documentation. You'll then need to... You will then need to make sure that both devices are in what is called discoverable mode so that they can see each other. Once both devices see each other, you should see the device you're trying to connect to under the list of discoverable devices. And so then you need to select the appropriate device. Now be careful because you may see other devices there, not just the one you're trying to connect to. Then you're typically asked to either confirm or enter a PIN or a passphrase in order to confirm that you're connecting to the right devices. Then after that, they should instantly be connected and you can start using that device. So the next step is to test that you can actually communicate. These are the settings on my Android phone. I will select connections. Then I would select Bluetooth and toggle the switch on if it's not already on. And as you can see from the message, it says that my phone is currently visible to nearby devices. 
And so if I was pairing to another device and I have it in discovered mode, it should show up in the list of devices down below. And you can already see devices that I have previous, previously connected to showing up under my paired devices. Cell phones today are connecting to several satellites. All of our cell phones are connecting to multiple satellites every day using a process known as GPS, our global positioning system. GPS was created by the Department of Defense and there's currently more than 30 satellites in orbit around us every day. Thanks to all, thanks to all the satellites, thanks to all these satellites, it allows us to get very precise navigation. And as long as our cell phones can communicate with at least four of these satellites, they're able to get a very precise location regardless of where they're at around the world. And our phones calculate all this by determining the timing differences between our cell phone devices and all these different satellites around us. They can calculate your longitude, your latitude, and even your altitude of where you may be at. You see this all the time on your phones when you open up your maps app, or if you're looking for nearby locations on your social media apps. And while GPS is the primary source of this location, of this location information, our cell phones are so smart that they can even use the Wi-Fi signals nearby or even, cell or even cell towers around you. And large organizations even have an MDM policy or a mobile device management policy. This is where the IT department manages all these mobile devices that are owned by these organizations. And they may even be, <clears throat> and there may even be management options for user-owned devices if they're being used for work purposes. This is often referred to as bring your own device or BYOD. This allows the manager from a central location to gain access to all the different mobile devices in the MDM area. To all the different mobile devices through the MDM policy and manage them and manage them as needed for the organization. You can set policies on the apps that are in use or are allowed to download on it. You can set policies on the type of data and how it's secured on your phone. You can even set policies on how often or what updates are allowed to go to the phones. You may want to disable the camera functions on any mobile devices covered under the MDM, anything like that, really. If this is a BYOD device that's under the M MDM, if this is a BYOD device that's under the mobile device management plan, you may want to partition out a specific area of that phone that's only for work and and so that you can set these policies and these restrictions on the company's data and keep it separated from the user's private data. And it also allows you to remotely remove any of the company's information from that mobile device without affecting the user's profile on it. And you may also use this to enforce a two-factor security setting across all mobile devices on your network. This can also this can also make this can also make configuring a mobile device a lot easier. For example, you can use the MDM policies to automatically set up any work any work related profiles or accounts the user may need on their mobile devices. For example, if you have special email configurations, you can automatically do this through the MDM so that the user doesn't have to set up any details themselves. And I mentioned earlier, you can use an MDM to enforce two-factor authentication on mobile devices. You can require the users on their M You can require any users using the mobile devices to set up a specific authentication type, whether that's biometrics, a specific character pin, 
uh, or, or using a specific authenticator app. And obviously, if this is a company-owned mobile device under the MDM, you can restrict what type of apps the user is able to download onto the device or whitelist them as needed. Or if this is a user device, you can push out through the MDM any company-related apps that they may need to do their job so they don't have to try to find the app or sign into the app. It can just be automatically pushed out there to them for them to use. 